So, uh, Michael Neusen, uh today we will speak about uh, uh, Roger Shepard and some inequalities for general measures. Please. So, uh, thank you for the invitation and the, the chance to speak. Um, so, the, the point of the talk will be twofold it'll be geometric in nature and analytic in nature. And the Roger Shepard and Jung inequalities kind of serve as reverse forms of, of important inequalities in, in the field of convex geometry, one which is concave in nature and one which is uh, isoparametric in nature. So, so let's, let's just start by mentioning that uh, this is based on two joint works, one with David Alonso Gutierrez, Maria Hernandez Sifri, Jesus Shepes Nicholas, Artem Zavavich, and a separate work with Dylan Langhurst and Artem Zavavich. So to begin, uh, we'll always consider subsets of Rn. So always compact subsets of Rn, uh, which are convex, and we call these convex bodies. And uh, just to, sorry, give me one sec. Just to show what I mean by convex, I mean that your set K, which is you know not perfectly drawn, sorry, let's, uh, let's do it this way. Uh, Whenever I take two points in the set, say X and Y, I can always connect the points uh, with a straight line, so a geodesic line, without leaving without leaving the set K. Uh, so this will always be a convex body, whether it's a, a ball, a, a polyhedra, a ellipsoid, linear image of these, uh, this will always be, be what we consider. And the set of all convex bodies will be denoted throughout the talk by uh, script K. Uh, on the collection of convex bodies, it makes sense to consider an addition operation. And the, the addition operation is called the Minkowski sum. And the Minkowski sum of a convex body K with another convex body L is just the, the vectorial sums of all elements in K and all elements in L. And then uh, one of the one of the main features that we're going to consider is actually this can be equivalently stated as if you you can fix your body k, you can reflect l about the origin, and then you can shift the reflected copy of l in all such ways that it intersects with k. And this this will be the Minkowski sum. And just to see if I take uh, if I take a square, and I add to it a a, a disk, you really get this extended version of the square. So the Minkowski sum is more or less up to convexity. You can just consider where you where you move the ball around the boundary. And, and this is what the Minkowski sum is. Uh, you could do the same thing with a triangle. If it was just a triangle, you would then have this, this extended triangle. OK. And one more thing which we consider, which I, I had failed to write, is, is uh, multiplication. But multiplication here means uh, dilation. So I take some positive constant alpha, and I define the set alpha times k to be exactly the set of all alpha y, such that y belongs to the set k. And like I said before, I define negative k just to be the set of all minus y, such that y is in k, just the, the reflection about the origin of, of the body k. OK. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. Give, give me one second. Apologies. Let's go back. OK. So I have, in addition, I have a dilation which plays uh, the relation of a multiplication. And so with these two operations, the Minkowski sum and the dilation, the, the, the class of convex bodies actually forms a, 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 co a convex cone, so an infinite dimensional uh, convex cone. Uh, I won't say too much about this, but this, if you wanted some algebraic structure, is what it is. You can equip it with the distance. And I'll, I'll come to this to this later. Uh, the key feature of convex geometry, what kind of connects it to analysis, is the so-called Brumankowski inequality. And it asserts that for any, any convex bodies K and L, when you take the n-dimensional volume of the Minkowski sum of K and L raised to the power 1 over n, this always exceeds the volume of K to the 1 over n plus the volume of L to the 1 over n. And there's a quality only if L is homothetic to K. This exactly means that L can be obtained from K through, um, through isometries. You can you, you scale and you, you not isometries, but um, dilations and, and shifts. Uh, and 
here, maybe I should make a comment on what I mean by volume. What I mean by volume is just the, the honest volume. If you have a square, it's the length times width. And if it's just a, a general set, it is exactly the Lebesgue integral of the characteristic function of the set. Uh, okay. Moreover, you can scale in such a way. So you can take convex combinations of K and L. So if I take one minus T times K plus T L in its place. So if I take volume of one minus T K plus T L with one over N, then you can use the fact that the volume is homogeneous of degree N to say that uh, the Bruman-Kosky inequality asserts that the volume of uh, convex bodies is a uh, one over n concave as a function. So it says that the volume functional acting on the cone of convex bodies is is one over n concave. Okay, so let's clear this. All right, this. ask a question. Uh, uh, yeah, about the definition of the Minkowski uh, sum. Yes, please. Uh, what if you shift, uh, say you, you instead of L, you say you, you shift to L, you know, is mm -hmm. apply left translation, does it, how does it affect? Ah, uh, you're asking if I can, if I could do it instead with K instead of L, is this what you're asking? So instead of, say you fix K, okay, you, instead of L, you, you, you shift L. Ah, uh, instead of minus L, you shift L itself. Yeah. Then you're taking k plus negative l. You, you're reflecting l. So instead of k plus l, you would you would define k plus negative l, and it would be k intersect x plus l. And this is. No, I mean what, just a uh, just translation. Apply translation to l. So you want to take k and move it to l. This is what you mean. Um, I, I, no, just like, instead of consider k plus l, you consider mm -hmm. k. Plus uh, a translation copy ah, of ah, L. Ah, ah, ah. K, K plus L plus X. Yeah. This is what you mean. Then uh, you would have instead of minus L. Oh, yes, a translation of Oh, yeah, just exactly. translation copy of this. Sure. No, I mean, okay, uh, okay, so. sure. This, this is fine. Okay. No, no, okay. I mean, it would fit. You would do K plus Y L. This is all X such that K intersect X. Yeah, yeah just, uh, okay, just translation yeah. copy of this. So, exactly. Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. Sorry, sorry okay. about that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So we have Brumankowski. We have its equality conditions, and actually, uh, as you can see, uh, Brumankowski, its concavity depends on the dimension, but you can actually get a dimension free form. You can apply this famous arithmetic geometric mean inequality. This just says that the logarithm is a is a concave function. And if you use the, the concavity of the logarithm, uh, Brumankowski inequality can take the form, the volume of the convex combination of K with, with L always exceeds the volume of K to the one minus T power times the volume of L to the T power. And this is weaker again, because you use the concavity of the logarithm. But uh, in fact, because volume is homogeneous, you can, you can argue backward. You can show that this weaker dimension free form is equivalent to, to the, the dimensional form of the Brumankowski inequality. But uh, I don't want to comment too much on this. I just wanted to make a note that uh, from one over n concavity, you can derive weaker forms of concavity, like, like log logarithmic concavity. OK. Uh, so the, the, real, the real gem of Brumankowski, it's its uh, key feature, is that uh, you can solve the isoparametric problem for convex bodies in Euclidean space in a very elegant way. So if you define the, the surface area of a convex body K to be exactly the, the difference quotient of K plus epsilon the Euclidean ball take volume minus volume of K all divided by epsilon, this is surface area. If I, if I go back to, to the picture here, if K is the square and B is a ball of radius epsilon, you, you take K and you extend it just a little bit, and the idea is that you have you have some epsilon here, and you take these volumes of all of these pieces, and you you send it in the limit, 
to to the boundary of 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 your guy k and and this makes sense because all of these things are are continuous so it's it's nice and so from here you can you can honestly just apply brumenkowski to the definition here of the difference quotient and and you'll get minkowski's inequality so if you if you use brumenkowski you can say you know vol volume in dimension m minus one of the boundary of k uh, always exceeds the limit as epsilon goes to zero from the right of volume of k plus epsilon the Euclidean ball is always bigger than um, volume of k, the one over n plus epsilon volume of the Euclidean ball, the one over n to the n. Unfortunately, I'm running out over minus the volume of k, whole thing divided by epsilon. And then you can open the parentheses using the binomial theorem and really check that, that this goes uh, to something quite nice. And by something quite nice, I mean uh, what we call the Minkowski inequality. It says exactly that the, the surface area of any convex body always exceeds n times the volume of that body to an appropriate power. In this case, it's n minus one over n times the volume of the Euclidean ball to the one over n. And then you really use the fact that n times the volume of the Euclidean ball is the, the volume of its boundary. So the, the volume of the, the sphere, S, Sm minus one, is n volume of the Euclidean ball. And this becomes exactly the isoparametric inequality. So it says that the volume of the boundary of K or the surface area of K divided by the surface area of the Euclidean ball with power one over n minus one always exceeds the volume of K over the volume of the Euclidean ball. And uh, this is one very nice application of, of Brumenkowski. If we would like another one, let me let me just make a quick comment about just, just one more before we continue. Um, if I take any convex body K and I cut it with a hyperplane, say, say H is some hyperplane, this is some direction theta, on the sphere, and I consider the the function f of uh, let's say x is the volume of in m minus one of k intersected with h plus x. So I'm just taking all x in the orthogonal complement and I'm moving up and down. I'm going like this, and I'm measuring all of these. And I'm taking these vol these these volumes here of these of these sections. Brumenkowski asserts that the function f is one over n minus one concave. So this is one one feature of this, but even more, if f if k is symmetric about the origin. then even more is true then the maximum of this of the sectional function the maximum over all x in just h perp the orthogonal complement of h of f of x is in fact the central section it is the one which passes through the origin because if you have an even concave function the maximum must happen at zero so it's in fact the volume in m minus one of k intersected with h and this this is a very nice feature for any origin symmetric convex body, the section of maximal volume must be the central section, the one which passes through the origin in any direction. Uh, so this is another application of Brumenkowski. Okay, uh, let me just make a comment that Brumenkowski is not a unique occurrence for volume. In fact, you have a whole class of measures which exhibit Brumenkowski type inequalities. So if we fix some parameter s from minus one over the dimension to plus infinity and some time t between zero and one, and we have some Borel measure uh, with density phi, where phi is s concave. And by phi is s concave, I mean that when you raise phi to the s power, it is a concave function of it on its support. And any pair of reasonable sets, say open sets, uh, compact sets, something like this, 
Uh, then one has that mu is beta concave, where beta being some parameter which depends on the, the concavity of phi and the dimension. And, and this exactly just means Bruminkowski for this measure. It means that mu of the convex combination of the sets A and B always exceeds the, the convex combination of the measures of A and B, each raised to the appropriate beta power. So volume is one over n concave, or as we also checked, it's also zero, zero concave. If you take a limit here, as beta goes to zero, you'll see that this means that mu of one minus TA plus TB is bigger than the measure of A to the one minus T plus the measure of B, or times the measure of B to the, to the T power. And just as an example, one can consider the normal distribution, the, the standard Gaussian measure. So it, in fact, the Gaussian measure satisfies what we call the geometric Bruminkowski inequality. It says that for any pair of borel sets A and B, uh, the Gaussian measure of the convex Minkowski combination of A with B is always greater than the product of the Gaussian measure of A to the one minus T times the Gaussian measure of B to the T. And one can, even with the Gaussian measure, go back into the definition, define the, the, sur the Gaussian surface area of a convex body, use, again, with the same proof, uh, this form of the Bruminkowski inequality and prove an isoparametric inequality for, for uh, sets with respect to the Gaussian measure. So in Gauss space rather than in, in Euclidean space. And you, you have a whole family of these things. And one way to prove this inequality is to use this thing called the procopal einler inequality. I won't talk about this, but it's a reverse holder type inequality. It's, it's very, very nice. It's very, very useful in statistics, useful in probability, useful in, in geometry, as it turns out. I mean, it's, it, it really is everywhere. Okay, so Brumankowski is beautiful, but it's it seems reasonable to expect that maybe one can consider a reverse form. So, so let's kind of motivate this. If I take a convex body K, any convex body that I want, and say I add to it its negative, and I take volume. So if I take volume of K plus negative K, and this is exactly what I mean by K minus K. K minus K is not the origin, but it's the set of all vectoral sums of elements of k with elements of the reflection of k about the origin. For example, if I just take the simplex in the first octet and I reflect it here, and I take all combinations, you in fact get a hexagon like this. This would, in this case, this would be k minus k. I'm sorry for the, for the bad uh, handwriting, but it's, it's just to illustrate the fact that in this world in which we live, when you take a set minus itself, it's not just the origin, it's not just zero, it could even be something which is bigger. Uh, but the, the main point is that when you take a set, you reflect it, and when you add them together, you get something which is origin symmetric. And to this, if you apply the Bruminkowski inequality, this tells you that volume of k plus negative k is always bigger than uh, what? the volume of k for free with power one over n plus volume of k minus k with power one over n all with power n okay but the volume is something which is symmetric it doesn't care if you are flat so this is in fact twice volume of k to the one over n all to the n this is greater or equal this is simply equal to two to the n volume of your body k Okay, but uh, what does this mean? Well, Brumankowski says that you have equality if and only if from uh, K and L, there, one of them must be a positive scale and a shift of the other. Uh, but in this case, it means what? How, how is K equal to its reflection? It just simply means that, they, that K has to be origin symmetric to begin with. So there's a quality in this specific form of Brumankowski if and only if K is symmetric about the origin. And from here, one can ask, but does this reverse? We have a, an inequality which in a volumetric way classifies origin symmetric convex bodies. You're origin symmetric if and only if you have a quality with this difference body. Uh, okay, but uh, in the 1950s, this person named Rogers and this person named Shepard asked exactly the opposite. 
can you find some constant, maybe depending on the dimension, such that Brumankovsky reverses? And the answer is yes. So if you have any convex body, I don't care where it's placed. If you take volume of k plus negative k, this is always smaller than 2n choose n times the volume of k. And what is very beautiful about this is exactly the fact that it classifies the simplex, which is about as far from origin symmetric as one can be. It says that you obtain equality if and only if you're a triangle. And this was exactly um, in dimension two, the picture that I had drawn. You take this triangle, you take this one, and then you take this and this. But you can see that there's exactly six copies of this same triangle packed into this into this hexagon. In dimension two, it, it's very easy to see um, that you should obtain equality for a simplex. Uh, okay. And I'm going to just mention something uh, real quick, but this person named Rolf Schneider in the 1970s proved a much more general version of this inequality. He in fact proved that if instead of you know just the standard Minkowski sum, you take a convex body, you take p independent copies of Euclidean space, and you shift k in these different directions, and you look where it's non-empty, then the np dimensional volume of this p difference body never exceeds np plus n choose n times the volume of the original body to the pth power. And this, in fact, classifies the simplex again. There's a quality if and only if k is a simplex. And if you pick p equal to 1, uh, you get the, the classical Roger Shepard inequality. OK, so uh, this led us to ask a question. We know that Brumankowski exists for more general classes of measures, you know, like the Gaussian. Can one hope that if you have some measure on Euclidean space with density, uh, that you can bound the, the mu measure of the difference body above by some dimensional constant times the, times the measure of k? Unfortunately, no. Uh, it's fairly easy to see if you take the Gaussian measure, just even in one dimension, uh, this fails to be the case. And let me let me just show you why. What I can do is I can take, you know, anything which looks like this. Let's say this is our, our measure uh, mu. And I take k here. It's just convex in dimension one, just means it's some compact interval. And what I can do is I can take any interval I want and I can move it far, far away from the origin, wherever I want. But this guy, this k minus k in this case, is always origin symmetric. So it's always here. No matter what I do, no matter how far away I move k, this guy will always have positive Gaussian measure. Where this one, I mean, I can make it as small as I want, even, even much, much smaller than this, no matter by what I multiply it by, right? And this shows that, that somehow the position of the body matters. It matters where you put it with respect to, to the measure that you consider. Volume doesn't care. You can, you can shift it as much as you want. It's just constant. But once you start allowing for dipping or, or going up, you, one needs to treat it with care. And this is exactly what we, were, what we were able to do. So we can take a measure, which has a density. And the density, what the, the requirement that I take is that in one dimension, it is a decreasing function from the origin. So whenever I look in a direction, no matter what direction I look in, it is simply a decreasing function. For example, the Gaussian. If you, if you look at the normal distribution in, in n dimensions and you pick any direction, it is a decreasing function from the origin. Then Roger Shepard actually holds up to, up to an averaging. So it says that for, for such measures, uh, mu of the difference body never exceeds the same constant, 2 and choose n, so it's independent of the measure times a minimum among averages of these shifted versions of k and the shifted versions of minus k. So you take into account where you put where you put your body k. And then Roger Shepard holds an effect. But the comment I just made, if you take volume, then mu of uh, negative y plus k is just volume of k. It doesn't matter where you put it. You integrate it over k. You can use Fubini theorem. Separate the two. This is just volume of k squared. And then divide by volume of k, this is volume of k. So, so it's Roger Shepard. And maybe it's worth noting, um, if you would like, if there's enough time, I will uh, prove the Roger Shepard inequality toward the end of the talk. 
So this is very nice. And then we classify the quality under one small assumption. If you assume continuity at the origin, then a quality holds if and only if mu is a positive multiple of the Lebesgue measure on the difference body, k minus k, and k itself is a simplex. Uh, and just to have an example in mind, this condition that we picked that it's as a one dimensional function, it has to be decreasing, can't be removed. And, and this can be seen here. What you can do is you can take uh, k just to be the Euclidean ball, and then its difference body because it's origin symmetric just blows it up by twice. And so you take the difference body and around it, you take k and you pack the boundary with six copies. This is the constant that we have. You know, uh, four choose two is six. And then you take a small annulus, very, very small annulus around the boundary of K. And then a small disk in the middle, which doesn't intersect any of the balls. And you say, okay, let phi be the density one on the disk, one on the annulus, zero everywhere else. And then it's clear uh, just from the picture that uh, the, the measure of B2 minus B2 is whatever it is, but it but it is bigger than six times even the largest shift uh, of, of the original ball. So you cannot remove this assumption that it that it is a, a decreasing function of one dimension. Okay, so I will skip this, but the, the main point was that one can also generalize this this inequality of Schneider. You can take specific product measures. You can pick some concavity. You can look at these sections that I was talking about. So you can cut the body. And then you can even prove that you have such a thing for the P difference body. But I, I don't want to comment too much on this. It's uh, a bit a bit too much. But uh, let's return to geometry. So for any convex body, you can in fact as associate to it uh, a convex function, which is called the support function. This just says that in any direction you look, you go to the boundary, you look at the unit outer normal, you take this value, you look at how far away it is from the origin. This is a support function. And you can, in fact, define Minkowski sum for this, if you wish. You define the Minkowski sum to be the convex body whose support function in every direction is the sum of the support functions of, of K and L and all of those directions. So this is another geometric interpretation of, uh, of the Minkowski sum. So rather than the pointwise one that we talked about before, this one really, really involves functions and, and measuring uh, distances from origin to, to, to affine hyperpoints. Okay, so uh, what's the point? So the point of it is to define what we call the projection body. And the projection body is the convex body. So you, you take K, you... Now, let, let me draw this. So you, you take your convex body K, you pick a direction theta, this one, and you look at the orthogonal complement here. This is theta perp. And you project K onto theta perp. You take this volume, and you define that to be the value of the support function in that direction. And then you can do it this way. You can pick instead, this is some other theta. You look here, you project again, you take this value, you do the same thing here, same thing here, and then you build a convex body based on these. And this convex body is called a uh, is called the projection body. And the point of the projection body is it's always origin symmetric, and it always is, is reasonable to deal with. It's one of these things that we call a zonoid. And zonoid, I just mean uh, is a limit of zonotopes. Zonotope uh, means if I take segments, so I, I take a segment this way, this way, this way, and I just add them. I take this segment plus this segment plus this segment, all finite combinations of such segments. If you take a collection of them, it's called a zonoid, and limit, uh, it's called a zonotope, and limits of these are zonoids. So an example would be, would be, uh, a circle, an ellipse, the square is another one. But a non-example is the uh, the simplex. Okay, so projection bodies. I mean, they're they're very hard to visualize. Let me make a comment that 
every convex body which is symmetric about the origin is in fact a projection body. This can be seen basically by the picture that I showed you. You're, you're projecting, you're stretching. This amounts in dimension two to just dilating the body and then rotating it by pi over two. And, and this is how you get the projection body, but only in the origin symmetric case. Okay, but um, what did I say about support function? Support, oh, sorry. Support function must always somehow be convex, right? It, it is a, a homogeneous function because the scalar product and the maximum are, are homogeneous at degree one. And it's convex because Maximum is sublinear. Uh, so what about this? I mean, this is uh, some volume of projections. How how do you understand that it's that it is a convex function? Well, we start with this thing called the Kvariagram, and and from this the understanding is born. So the Kvariagram is uh, we go back to the definition that we talked about. We take uh, the Minkowski sum, but in the sense of when one body is fixed and the other one is moved. So it, in, in this role, in the Minkowski sum, it's k plus negative k. And so, so what you honestly do is you take, you fix k and you move k and you look at all these volumes of these intersections. But this is just the same if you take uh, the convolution in the analytic sense of the characteristic function of k with negative k. And from here, it was checked in the 1970s by a French mathematician named Mitharian that if you look in any direction and you take a radial derivative of this covariogram function, this is in fact minus one half, the integral over the surface of the convex body k, the absolute value of the scalar product of the direction with this nk of y, this is the outer unit normal pointing in the appropriate direction. So if I look this way, I look at the boundary and I look this way, when I touch the, the hyperplane, that is the outer unit normal. And that this is actually then equal to minus volume of the projection onto theta perp. And as we defined it, it's negative the support function. And from, from the second equation, this minus one half integral over the boundary scalar product, this is a convex function. This is a convex function exactly because the scalar product is homogeneous and uh, you have the triangle inequality for the Euclidean norm. And then uh, the integral is a linear. So, so it all works out very, very nicely. Okay, and then uh, so projection bodies. Why were they even born? Why would why would anyone care about such things? It's to answer a question uh, posed by by Shepard, uh, a very very old one, which asked the following. It says that if I have two origin symmetric convex bodies K and L, so this one, and say say this one, L and K, and I look in a direction theta, and this one, and this one and I project, and I look at this volume, and I project here, and I also look at this volume. And if in all directions, the volume of K, volume, in N minus one dimensions of K, projected onto the orthogonal complement, is always smaller than or equal to the volume of L projected onto the orthogonal complement. So in all directions, the, the projectional volume of L is smaller than the projectional volume of K, does this then imply that the volume of K is always smaller than or equal to the volume of L? This was the question, and there's a similar one for sections when you cut them and, and you look at them. This one's called the Bosom and Petty problem, but um, it's not exactly in the, in, within the context. And the answer to this was done by this guy named Petty and Schneider simultaneously. Um, and the answer is yes, in dimension two and one, and no, starting from dimension three. And if we formulate in the language of projection bodies, it exactly says that if the projection body of K in every direction is always contained in the projection body of L in every direction, must volume of K be smaller than volume of L? The answer is yes, in dimension two, exactly because every origin symmetric convex body is itself a projection body. And in dimension three and above, there one can construct counterexamples to where it doesn't work. Okay, so this is where where it was born, but uh, why does interest continue from there? Interest continues from there because of a, a question asked by Petty about uh, four or five years after his solution to the Shepard problem. 
what you do is you can, can you consider an affine invariant by affine invariant. I mean, whenever you take a convex body K, you apply a, an affine image to this quantity, it remains unchanged. Nothing, nothing is affected. Then what he said is for a convex body, you take the volume of K raised to the power of one minus N, multiply it by volume of its projection body from dimension three and up is this minimized by ellipsoids. So it is isoparametric in nature, right? We Before we talked about surface area and uh, which convex bodies minimize this one. The next question is which convex bodies minimize this one? Uh, and the answer is unknown. I mean, it, it is an exceptionally hard problem. Uh, it was shown by sour glue and that it is not preserved under standard symmetrization. I won't talk too much about what standard symmetrization means, but essentially it's a it's an extremely geometric way to, to prove isoparametric inequalities. One can prove Brumankowski from, from this technique. But let me just uh, express to you that the fact that this doesn't work makes this problem extremely difficult because uh, this is a very common technique used in the field to prove such such inequalities. Okay. So so this is this is nice. Um, so I, I can't say too much about it. There are two books where you can read about this problem's history. One is by Rolf Schneider, one is by Richard Gardner. Each book is about 700 pages, but they really have many, many open problems and many, many beautiful results in, in, within these books. Okay, but uh, let me collect some positive answers in the direction of this conjecture. One is that if one knows this thing called the Boozman centroid inequality with its equality conditions for polar zonoids, then one can prove Petty's conjectured inequality with its associated equality condition for ellipsoids. This is something people haven't been able to solve, and still people don't really have much of an idea of how to tackle this. Uh, this person named Erwin Ludwak showed Petty's conjecture in connection to other uh, isoparametric problems and, and other things in, in the field. And as a positive answer, it was shown by, by my advisor, Artem, and uh, by Christoph Sauerglue, that in fact, Petty's conjecture holds when your convex body K is not too far from, from the Euclidean ball. What do I mean by not too far? Just that uh, it, it's like a, a small perturbation. It goes a little bit inside of the ball and a little bit outside of the ball. In this case, Petty's conjecture holds. And it's based on a work of uh, Alexander Fish, Fedor Nazarov, Dmitry Ryabogin, and Artem about fixed points of the intersection body operator. So this talk, we're talking about projection bodies. It can be seen as an operator on the class of convex bodies. There's a, a dual one where you take instead, inter, you take volumes of intersections. And they're, they're connected to, to one another in a very nice way. Uh, and more progress has been done by Mohamed and Vicky, by uh, Oscar Ortega Marino, and by Franz Schuster on these things called uh, Minkowski valuations. But uh, this is well out of the scope of the talk. I, I would just like to bring up positive results. Okay. Petty's conjecture is open, but one can instead consider the dual statement. You can take the volume of K, the M minus first power times the volume of the, the polar of the projection body. And here, the polar body of a convex body L circle is just a set of all X and R N such that the support function of L is always bounded from above by one. For example, if I take uh, if I take the diamond, its polar is, is the square. If I take an LP ball in n-dimensional Euclidean space for, for some P bigger than one, its polar body is the uh, BQ ball, where Q is the holder conjugate of P. Uh, these are these are the the most typical examples. But Petty was able to show that in fact this exhibits uh, a maximum, and the the maximum is for ellipsoid. So it's called the Petty projection inequality. So for any convex body K, if you consider the volume of K to the power m minus one times the volume of the polar projection body, this is always bounded from above by the volume of the Euclidean ball divided by the volume of the Euclidean ball one dimension lower to the nth power. And there's a quality if and only if k is an ellipsoid. So it is an affine isoparametric inequality, which classifies as the ellipsoid. And if one is interested 
in in Sobolov theory, then in fact Zhang uh, Gao Yong Zhang showed that Petty's projection inequality not only implies but is in fact equivalent to a strengthening to a strengthened version of the Sobolov inequality. But I, I won't comment too much on this either. Okay, so like with Petty inequality, uh, like with Brumankowski, Roger Shepard serves as a reverse form of Brumankowski. Uh, Zhang was able to find a reverse version of the petty projection inequality, which has become known as uh, Zhang's inequality. So Zhang's inequality asserts the following. If this for any convex body K, when you take volume of K to power M minus one, as the volume of the polar projection body, it always exceeds two N choose N divided by N to the N, and there's a quality if and only if K is a simplex. So you again have uh, uh, a volumetric interpretation of a simplex. It says that K is a simplex only if this product set is, is equal to two N choose N divided by N to the N. Where with um, Roger Shepard, it says that K is a simplex if and only if the volume of its difference body is equal to two N choose N times the volume of K. So again, you, you have this quantity and on the upper end, you have something which is super, super symmetric, these ellipsoids. And on the bottom, you have something which is very, very not symmetric in, in the form of a simplex. And, and for this reason, this is a reverse isoparametric inequality in its nature. And it's really quite, quite a beautiful result. Um, okay. In the 1990s, in fact, uh, Richard Gardner and Zhang were able to find a whole class of convex bodies called radial mean bodies, which connect this k plus minus k to the polar projection body. And for this reason, connect Zhang's inequality to the Roger Shepard inequality. And the result is the following. So you can take any convex body k. You can take two parameters, p and q, which must exceed negative one. Then you can find two convex bodies associated to k, r p k and r q k, which we call the radial mean body, such that the volume of the difference body never exceeds some constant depending on the dimension and on p. Since the volume of the p radial mean body of k, this is always bounded from below, from above, by some constant depending on the dimension in q, since the volume of the q radial mean body of k. And this is always bounded from above by n to the n, volume of the body to the dimension times the volume of the poor projection body. And in every single one of them, there's a quality if and only if k is a simplex. And here, the constants depend on the beta function. Uh, for example, if you choose p and q to be equal to n, then this beta function, this the CRN becomes two n choose n. And in fact, you can you can check and they checked that when you take p equal to q equal to n, then the volume of the n radial mean body of k is in fact equal to the volume of k. And on the far left hand side, you get volume of the difference body is less than or equal to two n choose n volume of k. And all the way on the far right hand side, you get that the volume of k is less than or equal to uh, 2n choose n, uh, uh, n to the n divided by 2n choose n, volume of k to the n, volume of the polar projection body of k. And if you do some rearranging, you see that it is Zhang's inequality. And uh, they, in fact, even showed just a more general inclusion that for any convex body k, k minus k is contained in n times volume of k times the polar projection body of k. OK, so one can can use this inclusion together with an argument of integration and polar coordinates to show that Zhang's inequality holds for any measure having a density function. So if you take any measure on, on Euclidean space with absolutely continuous density, for example, the Gaussian, for example, the volume, then you have that this average of the Kvariagram function, so one over volume of k integral of volume of k intersected with x plus k taken with respect to the measure never exceeds the measure of n volume of k times the polar projection body. And this is asymptotically sharp, asymptotically sharp in the sense that I can find a version of it so that whatever dimension I pick, I, I can find a measure mu so that whatever dimension I pick, you, you have a quality here. So you can't improve it. But uh, the, the defect here is the fact that if I take volume, you don't get Zhang's inequality back. On, the, on this side, you get volume which is very great. On this side, you get uh, n to the n volume of k to the n times the volume of the polar projection body, 
but we're missing a two n choose n. So it's it's much, much weaker than Zhang's in the quality in the case of volume. And this is the question we ask. Okay, so what restriction has to be put on the measure mu so that you get you get the sharp version of, of Zhang's inequality? And so we consider the following. We we wanted to re discover what projection bodies mean in a measure theoretic setting. So it takes a measure mu with the density phi, non-negative in any convex body, then the mu covariogram of the convex body, which we call G sub mu of K of X, is just the mu measure of K intersected with X plus K. Or in other words, it's K convolved with uh, the characteristic function of K convolution with the characteristic function of minus K with respect to the measure mu. That this is all that this means. And for example, I mean, I, I ran it in a program, but if you take uh, a simplex, then it's gamma two polar projection body <laughs> is in fact equal to, to this guy here. But uh, let, let's see what I mean. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, the slides are out of order. Well, that's not good or I'm missing a slide. I'm missing a slide. Okay, let me let me write this down. From here, I define the the mu projection body of K to be the convex body whose support function in every direction is simply equal to, and I'm just going to grab this out of the hat and I'll explain later why I care about this, but it is one half integral over the boundary of k is the absolute value of the direction in a product with the outer unit normal in the fixed direction. And then instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the density phi and integrate it like this. So we showed that for volume, if phi is identically equal to 1, this is the support function of the projection body. So the only new thing here is instead, I include the density on the boundary of k. Okay, so why why should this definition be the choice? But uh, for now, let's 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 just take it. Well, we were able to show that in fact, if you take this guy and you take some increasing invertible function, and you take a measure that exhibits concavity with respect to this strictly increasing function, then for any convex body with positive measure, and such that when you integrate the gradient of the density over k, if this is zero, then the difference body of k is contained in this multiple of the measure of k with respect to f times the uh, mu polar projection body of k. So this is something we were able to show in our paper with Dylan and Artem, and we were able to show even more, and this is exactly why we, we picked this guy to be our definition. We take the mu covariogram, we want to look at its radial derivative, which is what we do. So we take a measure with some reasonable density, some, some differentiability assumptions. And so we take a convex body K, we take a measure mu, whose density is, is locally Lipschitz on some, some big open set containing K. Then for any direction, when you take the partial derivative, uh, the radial derivative of the mu covariogram in that direction theta, this is exactly minus one half integral over the boundary of K, the absolute value of the scalar product of theta with the outer unit normal k times the density plus some, some vector. This vector is exactly one half integral over k, the, the gradient of phi dy. And this is exactly the same as what Metherian did in the, 19, in the 1970s because the phi is identically one. So if I take volume, phi is identically one. Its gradient is zero, so this term eta mu k disappears. And in fact, if I take k to be symmetric about the origin and I take phi to be an even function, then its gradient is an odd function. I'm integrating an odd function over uh, an origin symmetric set. This eta mu k will also vanish. I can remove symmetry of k if I take k, which is, say, centered with respect to the Gaussian measure. Again, it can be uh, Sarah, with respect to the Gaussian measure, the gradient is the identity. You can again kill it off. So, so it makes sense in, in many, many different places to define, uh, to consider this first, this first portion as the definition of, of the guy. Okay, so we have this theorem. 
And yeah, so it makes sense to consider this as a definition of the support function of, of the new projection body of K. With this in hand, uh, my academic sister, Galina Leifschitz, actually had considered such a quantity before, considered uh, a version of the Shepard problem where volume is replaced by a measure and proved that in fact, the, the same solutions hold. So if you have this measure theoretic version of the Shepard problem and you have all of these projections, you take their mu measure, if one is always bigger than the, than the other one in every direction, must the measure of one be smaller than the measure of the other one? The answer is yes in dimensions one and two, no in dimensions three and above. And here's, here's just a lemma that we require. If we take uh, some measure with a radially non-decreasing, so now it's exactly the opposite of the, the measure theoretic Roger Shepard. Now I look in one uh, direction, in any direction, and then it must be an increasing function or, or constant. If I have a measure whose density satisfies this condition. I have some strictly, uh, I have some compactly supported concave function such that the origin belongs to the interior of its support and it attains its maximum at zero. Then for any increasing function from the non-negative reals to the reals, then we have this sort of uh, polar integral inequality. The integral over the support of f of q composed with f Taken against the measure nu is always bounded from above by beta times the integral over the over uh, the sphere, integral from zero to some function z of theta, the density in, in every ray times r to the n minus one dr d theta is just uh, integrating in polar coordinates. But here, z of theta is exactly minus one over the radial derivative of f at zero, and beta is some constant depending on the dimension, q and the maximum of f. And one can check that there's a quality if and only if he is constant. And what one does is one combines this lemma with the previous theorem about the radial derivative and you get a Jean type inequality. So you can take any convex body to appropriate measures uh, such that when you take some function from the positive reals to the positive reals and you compose it with the mu gram, if this is concave, then one has exactly that an averaged version of the new measures of of k never exceeds n over mu of k times a new of the measure of this scale or multiple of the shifted version of the forward projection body of k times some constant which depends on f. I mean, it's very ugly, but let's pick something very specific. If I pick some constant f bigger than zero and I assume that uh, new is a measure with a radially non-decreasing density, and mu is S concave. S concave in the sense that we considered way back at the beginning of the talk. And for any convex body K, one has exactly that N plus S to the minus one, choose N divided by the measure of K times the integral over K, nu of Y minus K, the new measure of Y minus K, taken with respect to the measure mu, never exceeds the new measure of S to the minus one, mu of K, and then the polar projection body of, uh, the, the polar of the mu projection body shifted by this eta of mu k. So if I pick S to be one over N, for example, and everything to be volume, then this uh, uh, N plus S to the minus one choose N becomes two N choose N. This mu of k is volume of k. This integral over k nu of y minus k d mu of k is volume of k squared. And then on the right hand side, you have n volume of k, pi polar of k, volume of this. You can use the fact that volume is homogeneous, pull out the n, so you have n to the n, pull out the volume k, so you have volume of k to the n, and then you have volume of the polar projection body of k is always bigger than or equal to 2n choose n, volume of k squared. You divide by volume of k squared, and this tells you, and then also divide by n to the n. And this tells you that 2n choose n divided by n to the n is smaller than the volume of k to the n minus one times the volume of the forward projection body of k, which is exactly Zhang's inequality. So th this is what we were able to prove. And I, I will skip it, but the last part is you're able to define a version of this instead of considering bodies, you can consider locally integrable functions. 
With that, how much how much time do I have left? Two more minutes. Four more? Two more minutes. Okay. So um I'm trying to think. Would you like to see a proof of something or I can just stop here? That's up to you. I can give a sketch of a proof. It's as you prefer. If if you're if you're too tired, I can stop. If you would like, I can sketch the proof of the Roger Shepard inequality. Okay, a sh a short sketch. Yeah. Sure. Then I'll, then I'll show the short sketch of Roger Shepard, and this will sort of give you the the whole idea of of why we even consider these things. So if you recall, the Roger Shepard inequality says exactly that k minus k smaller than or equal to to n choose n times volume of k. I'm writing absolute value instead of volume just just to save time. But here, you know, this equals volume just as we continue. Okay, so what do you do to prove this? What you do is you consider the covariogram. You consider the volume of k intersected with x plus k. And then what you do is you integrate this. So you go one dimension higher. You integrate this over Rm. And you take this with respect to x. So what you're doing is you're integrating, in other words, you're integrating uh, the characteristic function of k convolved with the characteristic function of minus k over Rm. Okay, but um, one can use this and write it as a double integral of the characteristic function of k of x and the characteristic function of k of y minus x dx uh, dy dx. You can use Fubini's theorem to move things around, but the key point is that this is just the volume of k whole thing squared. I won't comment too much about it, but that's what this means. So the real fight is how to get the lower bound. The idea is we, we want to get something smaller. And, and here's what we do. We integrate in polar coordinates. So we, we consider, again, this integral over our n, this volume of k intersected with x plus k dx. And we say this is, this, this is simply the same. This is exactly the same as the integral over s s n minus one integral from zero to something. What is that something? The idea is you go from here and you go all the way over and you look at this value on the boundary. Okay, but uh, the first thing, what is the support of this of this function? If we go back to the beginning of the talk, the support of this function is the Minkowski sum. So I'm integrating over the support of k plus uh, of this guy. It's k plus minus k. So I'll just denote this by something. I'll call it rho of k minus k. That's this value at the boundary in some direction u. And then I'll call this function f of x, whatever it is. So f of r theta, r to the n minus 1 dr d theta. This is what I do. And then what one checks, one checks that this is 1 over n concave. This is from Brumankowski. One, one can use the convexity of the convex body k together with the Brumankowski inequality to show that this is 1 over n concave. And so what you can do is, instead, you, you have a picture which looks like this. So here's k minus k. And then here's your function f to the 1 over n, the some concave function. And what do you do? You're looking at this function in every direction. You know it's concave. So it must, in every direction, always be greater than this line below it. And so you replace it with the line. You say that this is greater or equal than. I don't know what's wrong with my with my uh, tablet. Greater than or equal than the line. But the line is, OK, f of 0 integral over sm minus 1 integral from 0 to this row of k minus k of u, and then f is replaced by, I think it's 1 minus the radius divided by rho of k minus k over u to the nth power r to the n minus 1 dr du. OK, but from here, you do a change of variables. You glue things back together using, using Fubini's theorem in the opposite direction. And this is exactly 2n choose n to the minus 1 times f of 0. One can check this. But what is f of 0 here? f of 0. is the volume of k. Ah, sorry. Times f of 0 times volume of k minus k. Once you go with that together, you get volume of k minus k. So this is 2n choose n to the minus 1 
volume of k, volume of k minus k. And again, we said this is smaller than the volume of k squared. So you can kill off one of these, divide by 2n choose n. So you have k minus k less than or equal to 2n choose n volume of k. And then to get the equality conditions, Rogers and Shepard showed way back that k is a simplex if and only if uh, k intersect x plus k uh, are the same up to a scale. And this, this is how you get the equality conditions. OK, so I, I, I think I'll stop here. Are there any questions? Thank you, I make the talk. Sure. Any questions? Comments, anything? Okay, so you have a, you, 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 there's a question about, uh, you have two convex bodies, uh, the projection onto hyperplanes, the volume of projection is, for one is smaller than the other one, but it doesn't mean the volume of let's say A and B is smaller than the volume of B. Uh, yeah. So it is, it is, you said it's not training of starting from dimension three. Yes. But what if we consider, so you consider projection onto hyperplanes. What if we also consider projections on the F1 planes of all dimensions, not just a hyperplane, let's see. N minus two dimension, N minus three dimensional. People are still solving it. Ah, so still, still not true. We're still working on this. So still working on this. I'm working on this. Still open. Okay. Yep. So far as I know, not a whole solution has been has been cooked up yet. It's the same for the one with the sections. So it, you can do the same thing instead. Cut them. Ask the same thing. It turns out that it's true in dimension four and below, false in dimension five and above. But if you do lower dimensional sections. People are still trying to figure out what is correct and what is not. Okay, so okay. These are open questions. Is it true? Let's see. Uh, instead of consider volume, you, you, you have your projection that have the same. Let's see, the same. Let's say that you, I mean, differ by translation, that doesn't mean the convex volume are the same. Okay, so you're asking me if I go here and I project this way. No, just the volume. So the, just look at the, the shape of the projection. If they are just different by translation, or oh. doesn't it mean, I mean. <laughs> yeah, so, so you take the projection, you take volume, and you're saying also move it up here, but this would be unchanged. So, so instead of assume the, the projection have the same volume, you assume the projection have the same shape. That means just a different by translation. Does this imply the the, the the two convex bodies? Are, you know, are the same. So volume doesn't see translation. So I, I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm not. Talk, uh, the, the, yeah. It's not about the volume. Just uh, assume. Okay, okay so, yeah, so they have two convex they, bodies. They differ by a shift. Does yeah. So sense? their projections are all the same. All the projections are the same. Doesn't mean the the two mm -hmm. bodies are the same. Yes. 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 Okay. It's not an easy question, but yes. In the in the origin symmetric case, yes. This is a result. It comes from uh, this theorem called the Minkowski existence theorem, if I remember correctly. It was something proved by Alexandrov back in the 30s. But you need to use uh, this result that says that if you have a measure on the sphere, a Borel measure on the sphere, which is centered, so it, it has a fair center at the origin, and it's not concentrated on an integrate subsphere, then this measure uh, is associated to the to the surface area of a convex body, whatever this means. And then you can you can argue that uh, through through this representation that I showed you, with this integral over the boundary, you can use this to prove that they're the same. Something like this. If I understood your question correctly, yes. But uh, I also have to go back and look to make sure I'm not uh, saying the incorrect thing. 